benefits people get beyond just recycling for recycling's sake. That's the sort of thing that might appeal to that next group of people that haven't already bought into recycling only. When we've done studies like that, we've often found that there's a ratio of something like 10 to 1 in some cases in terms of how much other benefits, these indirect effects are valued by these people on a ratio of 10 to 1 compared to just the recycling tons or the not filling up the land, that sort of thing. And it's learning a product lesson from people like Ty. It's learning to sell on what people want to buy, not what you want to sell. Okay, so Ty very likely wants to sell you Ty because it's their highest profit item, right? I mean, this is the sort of message that they were going to be completely honest. It might be, buy Ty because it's our biggest profit item. Buy Ty because we make a lot of money on it, right? That is not how they educate. Recycle, you know, I see this in recycling, I see this in energy too. Buy energy efficient refrigerators. Well, those people who, already, who believe in energy efficiency already bought an energy efficient refrigerator. That's not the problem. The problem is selling that next label. Time's willing to go really dirty and sell miracles out of their product. But the bottom line is figure out what it is about, about the recycling program beyond strictly recycling that people want to buy and push that. At least get them connected in that way. And that helps explain their behavior. They're not being irrational people. They're making a decision based on a bundle of things that they get and give for, for the recycling program. And they're making a decision about whether it's worth it or not. Stress to them the things beyond just you know, the action of recycling and the fact that you get more tons that maybe they can connect with and sell them what they want to buy and not what you want to sell. They don't have to recycle for the reasons you think it's worth recycling. I will say, I know it sounds like a setup, but you know when we did a, a project in, that I'll talk about in a second, um, when we did this project in Colorado, we, we had a focus group to say, you know, what are some of the things that resonate with you in recycling? And why should people recycle? Well, we call them in the business forever. No, it's not about landfills filling out. No, it's about greenhouse gas and climate change and a bunch of other stuff, right? Didn't connect at all with the households. They totally wanted to recycle because they thought it would help, help keep landfills from filling up. Well, it's about, I say connect on that, and you're, you're welcome to then educate them beyond that. But to basically tell them they're stupid by educating them on, by, by selling them on something they don't connect with at all, that's just wasting your money, I think. And so I think you really need to sell people what they want to buy. If they want to buy an energy efficient refrigerator because it's pink, I would make the pinkest refrigerator I can find. You know what I mean? Sell them what they want to buy. And then the last thing I want to talk about for a few moments is social marketing. Because I think social marketing, not social media, social marketing is a really important um, way to, to move um, education in the recycling field forward. What we're talking about is educating and improving barriers and reflecting barriers and motivations, not simply information. And it's trying to use um, leveraging cultural, um, culturally sensitive links, using networks that people respond to, churches, you know, ethnic groups, whatever, neighborhoods, that neighborhood feeling, to address barriers to change and to get a personal approach going not a blanket or strata type approach. Okay, we're gonna target 65 plus year olds and, you know, all over the city, that sort of thing. It's not quite like that. Um, we've done lots of research on social marketing and it has certain recommendations, pledges, commitments, prompts, norms, a bunch of other stuff. They argue that you get greater participation. We reviewed over 200 studies that have been done in social marketing. We found the same three extremely large problems to meet. When you have a literature that's been going on for more than 20 years and you still haven't gotten an evaluation that has a sample size that's very big or still doesn't have a decent control group that tells you what the net impact is of that program beyond what would have happened without your program, if you still have no costs in your study as well as impacts that you can't figure out what the cost effectiveness is, I don't care if it's a private program. I'll make an adjustment to based on what I think, but don't give me no information. And in fact, lastly, no retention information on how long these social marketing changes have been um, last. That to me is a significant literature problem. And you know, after, while I, you know, I, I end up after reading all the literature, do, we do a lot of social marketing in terms of pay as you throw and measure that a lot, but we couldn't find any decent evaluations of other social marketing programs 20, 20 years on. To me, that, mean, that makes me pretty skeptical. If there isn't information, I'm guessing there's bad information that people are not telling me. And, and they just want to keep signing cute, you know, posters. And that's not, to me, a program worth considering. So we did a, a, 
I looked around for, for a really long time for a grant and found a grant finally and would love to find more, but it was a big, a big uh, problem to find this one. And so what we did was we set up an evaluation of social marketing the way that it needs to be set up, which was we had a um, pre, post, and control group to get a net impact. We had a group one was the control group, group two was a partial treatment where we did social marketing information, but we did not do door to door. The last one did the same information, but we did door to door as well. And so we, um, we did that in a community in Colorado that was very much alike. It was a, um, a suburban area, all serviced with the same HOA, all serviced by the same hauler, all getting the same kind of information so that we could do a real test of what would happen. And there were about 500 plus households in each neighborhood, each row. We measured pre and post. We, this was designed with specific ton of pounds changes in recycling and energy behavior changes on the energy side. So we need both. And we did all the basic CBSM steps for those who are familiar with the literature. And we set up, as I said, specific goals. We said, help, help. Sorry, uh, there. Set up, we set up specific goals, and we measured tons before, during, after, and then after, a lot after. We measured, um, we did sorts pre and post. We did surveys pre and post and post post. We did web hits, joinings, all that sort of stuff, and we did a buy to those three. I mentioned the focus group and the fact that that helped us figure out barriers and motivations, and motivations, sad to say, weren't the lofty greenhouse gas things, but other things that people can relate to. And um, we did a lot of um, information tracking about what were the barriers for energy and recycling. And then we did a whole bunch of contact. And we did way more than what we do to be an optimally cost efficient program. Instead, what we did was we, we measured, we did a whole bunch of different things, and then measured weekly what impact was so we could see how much impact we. How much of a bag do we get from a postcard? How much of a bag do we get from a handbill? How much of a bag do we get from a door knocking? That sort of stuff. A call, a robo call, et cetera, et cetera. And then we can look at some of those, those differential impacts. But we, we did as vivid a messaging as we could related to the things that, that mattered to them. And um, had contests as well, which were very effective. Um, what, we asked people to spill out commitment cards, and we had a contest around the commitment cards. So in the neighborhood where we didn't do door to door, we got, I think it was, I would say, 6% returns, maybe. In the neighborhood where we did door to door, we got 40% returns. When we had the contest and said, if your street gets the most returns, you get, each of you gets a $5 thing for Starbucks, we got 60% returns. So contests can matter, as well as door to door can matter. Um, we, did, we did contests also about how clean was your recycling and how clean was your Crash and whether was there any contamination and people who passed our test when we had we did a random um, in the neighborhoods who passed our test got a fifty dollar on the whole, whole foods very popular program and we did a whole lot of website stuff as well but while many people said they're on Facebook etc cetera, etc cetera, not I think when people are on the, on the web they're doing Facebook etc cetera, etc cetera, they're not coming to our kinds of programs it, you'll get traffic for the same old people over and over again. I know that some cities devote whole staff members to their Facebook and Twitter stuff. I don't know. Um, I think you're talking to the same same tribe. And all that. But again, needs testing, but that's my gut from hearing what I heard and seeing what I've seen. We asked for people's commit commitments, and we found that things like paper recycling, installing a CFL, most popular things people would want to said that they were committed to changing. Some of the less, the things they weren't as interested in doing were. Um, resetting thermostats, talking to their neighbors, a few other things not so popular to commit to do. When we measured the greenhouse gas impacts of those commitments, not yet of the actions, we thought about half of the greenhouse gases that we would get from those were from energy measures, about half from recycling measures, with the bulk of the things of doing water, and doing laundry in cold water, and doing paper recycling. The energy behaviors all had some great behavior uh, changes. We found better uh, participation and better um, responses on the surveys from the control group to the um, social marketing without door-to-door -door and social marketing with door-to-door -door even better. And that translates to a lot of you know, greenhouse gas measurements when we measure it. And this is the most important slide that we've got. This slide um, says that um, if, you, if you only saw the red, uh, the blue, blue things, you would say, well, and you only saw the first class two, which is what you see in most of the impacts, Say, oh gosh, look how much extra recycling I got from my program. Or look how much extra recycling I got from my program. That's all I'm going to report. That's
that's what you see in 90% of the, 95 percent of the reports out there. They didn't do a control group, which means to figure out what the impact is for this group, I need to subtract out that much to get what the net impact is through my program. Same thing here. This is the control group, group, group without uh, door to door, group with door to door. Much bigger impact with door to door, but you still need to net out that effect, right? So really great. Door to door matters a lot in what, what people did. And this is measured tonnage on a week to week basis. This is before versus after, measured tonnage. So we, these are real, real hard times. Then we also went back and we said nine months later, how much of that, you know, what, what's the story on tonnage now? What we found is that the control group bounced down. Now we have no idea why this was higher. Could be EPA did some kind of outreach program. Who knows? Or maybe it was, you know, the state of Colorado or anybody. Or maybe there was something in those weed commercials on the TV. Doesn't matter. This controls for it. That didn't happen later, and so the control group recycling went down. It also went down in the in the non-door-to-door -door route. Look at how much it went down. We had about 33% retention after nine months. In the door-to-door -door group, we had 75% retention after um, after nine months. That to me says there's some really powerful stuff going on here with this door-to-door -door thing. Now, the bad news is door-to-door -door is really expensive, right? You can't tell it on the graph because it's all to scale, but per house, it's you know multiple times as expensive per house to go out and do door to door in, um, work. But the cost per commitment, the cost per action taken, the cost per ton of greenhouse gas avoided, the cost per ton of recycling, all much better for the door to door route than for the than for the um, just go out and do social marketing. And I can guarantee you it's even a better number than when you get from just standard old outreach. You don't get that kind of tonnage at all. But what's the context? Right? So we're comparing it against things like curbside recycling, curbside yard waste, traditional outreach, and pay to pro. Well, if it lasts two years, then it's down here. The cost per ton is down here. If it only lasts one year, the cost per ton is way the heck out here. So not so good, right? But if you look at two year lifetimes, you start to compare pretty favorably with curbside recycling, curbside yard waste in terms of tons that, that you get from that program. So in context, it may be social market may be a program that's got some real legs. We looked at it, you compared things like um, ed energy programs and found that it performed better than some of the PV and renewables as well in terms of cost per metric ton. And even when we normalized by lifetime, we still found that the cost for social marketing um, door to door was quite, per ton was still quite a bit lower than what we found for some of the other programs. And darn it, that's what we that, sorry. Job impacts are also very good for these kinds of programs. And here, the darker one is the jobs per metric ton of poverty equivalent. But what's even better is the jobs per dollar spent on the program. Pay to throw huge um, dollars because you don't have huge jobs because you don't have to pay much. That's sort of self-funding. But you also see that even when compared to energy efficiency programs, which we're getting all of the stimulus money, right? Those weatherization programs. If you're talking job creation, percent recycling ought to better than it is. It's red bar is just as high as residential energy efficiency programs per dollar spent. So this is a real, a real Short-sightedness, I think, on the part of, of the, Fed, the Feds in some respects. If you're developing a supply curve, I would say make sure you're including energy. Um, uh, some of these uh, programs we've been talking about, the social marketing thing, as well as all the other recycling programs, to get toward greenhouse gas goals. It's not only about the energy programs; it's also about recycling programs. When we talk to communities that had their, measured their first five years of progress, very often the trash programs were the fastest to get them. Goals um, because they were way quicker to implement the energy program. So, a little bit of energy versus um, recycling context. Finally, takeaways on marketing information is not enough. Be appealing, be motivating, be barrier reducing, think about community, connect with people, don't, and don't focus on those who are converted. And don't focus on those who will never be converted. It's a waste of money to try to convert people who don't want to play. It's just not worth it. Q posters are not enough. You really need to evaluate programs and their cost effectiveness and their attention. And evaluation is really important for guiding decisions and spending of public funds. Think about self-efficacy. Think about the bundle of things beyond the indirect effects. Think about social marketing and um, go beyond it.